So if we're looking at a Walden Farms product or something that says calorie-free dressing, then we're looking at a product that per serving has five or less calories and 0.5 grams of fat per serving or less. Meaning that if you are having more than one serving, that could be adding up. So say you have um, three tablespoons per day and the serving size is one tablespoon. You could actually be contributing 1.5 grams of fat to your daily diet by having those three tablespoons. Not a big deal in the scheme of things, but something to keep in mind. Welcome to the Train With Sand podcast, where our goal is to help you look, feel, and perform like an athlete. In each episode, we're interviewing experts in training, nutrition, and sports performance who will help you separate fact from fiction in the fitness industry. Now, here's your host, a former professional athlete, certified personal trainer, and nutrition coach, Zan Barksdale. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to episode number 10 of the Train with Zan podcast. My name is Zan Barksdale. I'm your host. Thank you for coming back and listening to this episode. Uh, wow, hard to believe that we're already at episode number 10. We're in the double digits. This has been a lot of fun so far, and I appreciate all the great feedback that you guys are giving me about the show. Today's show is a really interesting one. The guest we have on is unbelievably smart, very well educated, and also a physique competitor herself. What we're going to do is we're going to walk with uh, a registered dietitian through a grocery store to help you better understand how to select foods that will help you look, feel, and perform like an athlete, how to read the labels, uh, how to make better decisions between fresh fruit, uh, frozen fruit, organic or grass-fed beef versus the regular stuff, uh, so to speak, and then some things, some do's and some don'ts that will basically help you become a better grocery shopper. Uh, again, thank you for coming by. I always want to remind you that this is episode number 10, so you can find the links, show notes, and timestamps at trainwithzan.com forward slash zero one zero for episode number 10. And again, while you're there, please enter your email address, sign up for the email newsletter so that you never miss a podcast release or an article or a video. I'll let you know as soon as they come out. So let's go ahead and get in today's episode with Lacey Dunn. Let's, let's get this party started in three... Two, one. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Really excited about today's guest. Uh, we have someone who's got a master's degree in nutrition. They're also a registered dietitian and a certified personal trainer. This is one of those people that just have the absolute um, credentials coming out the wazoo. They've got alphabet soup behind their last name. So really excited to talk uh, to the guest. And along with all the credentials, she's also an NPC bikini competitor and a sponsored athlete. She also runs her own business, which is an online coach, and hosts her own podcast called the Uplift Fit Nutrition Podcast. And she does a phenomenal Phenomenal job on social media. We'll link to her um, below in the show notes so that you can find her. But let's introduce Lacey Dunn. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. Hello, y'all. Nice to meet you. My name is Lacey. I'm a dietitian currently living in Houston, Texas. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, raised in Peachtree City, Georgia, and now I'm a Texas gal. I absolutely love everything and anything about nutrition. I'm kind of a nerd. And I'm excited to chat with you guys um, about multiple topics and see if we can really get into the nitty gritty of some things that people are just confused about. Well, definitely excited to talk to you. And we kind of hit on it a little bit. Uh, you know, today's show, it's, it's, it's kind of I want to teach people or have you teach people what we should be looking for, and what we should be trying to avoid as we're going through the grocery store. I know it feels like there's so many different things every day. You can read a new article or find a new post or see your favorite influencer online. They come out and say, you know, do this, don't do that that. And it's just so hard to wade through the information that it's nice to have someone who, you know, puts the information to use themselves as a NPC, you know, bikini competitor, but also somebody who has the credentials as a registered dietitian and has a master's degree. And, and you really know how the foods and the nutrition, um, you know, interacts with your body to help, you know, promote athletic development and body composition. Yeah. And the, the struggle for me was like, I've learned so much to the point where sometimes I've had to take a step back and tell myself like, it's not, don't get that detailed in your day to day life. Like nobody cares about that. And so it's really funny. You're like, does anybody need to know like exactly what happens on a cellular level or not? <laughs> well, it's paralysis by analysis. You know, exactly. as you get more interested in it, you want to research more and you want to learn more and you find yourself going down these rabbit holes that you just never come out of. Um, 
Um, so, you know, we're interested today in kind of get going over some practical information and some guides and some things that are actionable. Uh, but like I said earlier, you know, what I want to do is I want to pretend like we're walking through the grocery store together and, and just, you know, we can, if we were looking at nutrition labels uh, or if we're reading, you know, the, the tags on the food that we buy, I want to talk with you and maybe you can give us some tips and advice about things we should look for and maybe things we should avoid, um, you know, just as we go through the grocery store and the food industry in general. Yeah. So I think the most important thing is when we are first walking into the grocery store to realize that there are different quote unquote areas of the store and different dietitians may say, you know, walk around the perimeter, use the perimeter. But nowadays there are so many nutritious whole foods in the center of the grocery store as well. So I like to say, go through the entire grocery store, know your grocery store and understand that just because it looks like a quote unquote healthier grocery store does not mean that it's going to have more nutritious foods than a more simple grocery store like Kroger or HEB or even Walmart, even though Walmart is massive and contains more than food. So when we first go into a grocery store, there's different areas that we can go into. So we have the fresh produce section. We have the more refined um, foods and packaged foods and the canned goods all in the center. And then we have the frozen area. We also have dairy and um, eggs and meats and stuff like that. So I think what we should first dive into is kind of going into what different labels mean. That way people can decipher if they're worth the money, if they're worth paying for, and what it essentially means when they're eating it. Yeah, I would, so, I would definitely like to talk about the labels because I, I feel like there's so many things that, that are hidden on the labels. And I feel like the, the labels kind of lie to us sometimes, uh, whether it be the serving size or the ingredients uh, or there's just a number of things. So, yeah. So when you're looking at a label, what would be one of the first things you look for? The first things that I'm looking for are to look at the serving size, the total fat, the total carbohydrate added sugars, and protein. So those are the things that I specifically look for because I, what my diet is focused on is macronutrients. So fat, protein, and carbs are your macronutrients. And then I always want to look at sugars. So in a food now, it's a new labeling requirement, a product must put total sugars and then added sugars. So the total sugars is going to give you the total amount of sugar in the specific product and the added sugars label is going to give you the total amount of sugar that has been added to the product that is not naturally occurring. So if you look at a food, say it's like applesauce and you see it's total sugars, 15 grams, and then you see added sugars, five grams, you know that they put only five grams of added sugar in it. Then there could be another product that is another applesauce that it says total sugars, 20 grams, um, added sugars, 10 grams. So you know that they've put even more sugar in it than they would possibly have to put in. So those are the things that I directly look at right away. And ideally we'd want as few added sugars as possible, I'm assuming. Yes. Added sugars are, they have no nutritional value to them. It's just pure sugar. And that can come in the form of honey, monk fruit, uh, just plain sugar, cane sugar, coconut sugar. So there's a lot of uh, fake like there's a lot of names for sugar, but all sugar is sugar. Sure. Well, you know, let's kind of dive into that a little bit deeper. And I want to talk about a lot of topics, but sugar is a very popular topic online. And some people think it's the devil. Some people think, uh, you know, it, it, it's okay as long as you're taking in the right stuff. What's your stance on sugars? I like to say everything in moderation, um, because having a little bit of sugar and a little bit of sweetness, if you're craving it can be very important for honoring that craving and getting rid of it. Because what some people do is they, they try and stay away from it. And when they stay away from it, they just crave it even more. And then they go into binging episodes with it. So I like to say, if you're craving a little bit of sweetness, you know, have a little bit of something with real, with real sugar, you can make a healthy treat with, um, you know, without using sugar, with using stevia or a different sweetener blend. Um, um, but for the most part, everything in moderation for for me. I think that's a good tip. You know, I think a lot of people are to really have success, you have to be able to sustain your diet. And exactly. if you, if you try to cut anything out completely for an extended period of time, uh, it's just, it's just going to be difficult. You know, so so I'm with you. I, I completely agree. There's a spectrum. You can have too much. You can have too little. You kind of need to find the sweet spot. Um, 
Yeah, and I would say on average, as long as you're hitting your daily micronutrients, you're getting your vitamins and minerals, you're getting your daily vegetables and your fruit servings, and you're focusing on getting whole grains for the most part, having a little bit of sweetness and a little bit of refined product is not going to make or break you. Yeah, good, good tip. Very good tip. Um, now I, I did get off track a little bit there, and, and because it was important, and I think that's you know really good to go over. But as we're talking about nutritional labels and, and food value labels, uh, I want to get back to that because I've been doing some research lately, and I think you put a post on it uh, either on your blog or on Instagram. I've forgotten where I saw it. Again, I'll link to both in the show notes. Uh, but there are a lot of misconceptions about food labels. You know, we talk about the calories, and, and I recently read that the calories. Uh, Food companies have a 20% leeway. So if a, mm-hmm. if a food is listed as 100 calories, it may have as little as 80 or it may have as much as 120. And if I had to guess, I would assume most most companies usually underestimate the number of calories rather than overestimate. Um, are there any other you know tricks or any things that we should know like that that go on in food labels that you're aware of? Yeah, so that one is huge, especially if somebody's trying to track their macronutrients. I get my clients like, oh my gosh, I went over five grams of my protein today. And I'm like, seriously, that's not going to make a huge difference because everything added up or subtracted from when you're tracking with food labels is going to play a role anyway. Um, So what I really want to go over are common marketing terms that people fall for. So something like natural. So you'll see all natural or naturally produced. Um, And this actually means nothing unless it is meat and poultry. So if something says all natural and it's like some um, vegetable soup or it's a jelly, then it actually does not mean anything. It's not regulated. So the only thing that is actually regulated are meat and poultry products, and it means that there's no added color and it's minimally processed. Now, another thing to keep in mind is processed does not always mean bad uh, because technically anything that is processed just means that it has been changed from its original form. So if we look at oatmeal. We're looking at pure oats, steel cut oats. Well, it's been cut. It's been steel cut. So those are processed. We look at quick oats. Well, those have been ground. So technically those have been processed. So processed in the original form of the word just means it's been altered. That's interesting. So I actually wasn't aware of that. You know, obviously you, you hear a lot about you want to eat minim- minimally processed foods, um, but there, there probably are a lot more foods that are processed in some sort of way rather than others. Yes. Yeah. So very big difference there. I think that's a, I think that's a very good tip. Uh, you know, you you talked about natural food and natural labels. Uh, there's also a lot of things you see that say, uh, you know, fruit, you know, whether it be fruit flavored or fruit, um, uh, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but it says nat- you know, natural fruit flavors. And I'm assuming that's probably very similar to, to the natural label. Yeah, it really depends on what they're actually using. So that that wouldn't be a regulated term on a label. And I think that's an interesting topic. You know, we talk about that's that's the second time it's come up in just a matter of minutes that these things aren't regulated. You know, just because someone says <laughs> it or because someone markets it a, a product a particular way, it doesn't necessarily mean that's you know 100 percent true. And while we'd like to believe everybody, uh, that these big companies they're trying to sell us on food and they're trying to make us buy their product over someone else's, so it can definitely be confusing. And, and that's kind of the purpose of this episode is to hopefully clear some of these things up, you know, for the listeners and myself too. Yeah. So another thing that's super important to look at is um, looking at something that says like fat free or low fat or reduced fat or light and fat. And that and that also looks at, you know, low fat, low in calories, low in um, saturated fat, low in sodium. So all these different terms actually have specific um, regulations that they have to follow. So if something says free, then we're looking at For calories, five or less calories. If something says fat-free, we're looking at 0.5 grams of fat per serving or less. Um, And then saturated fat or trans fat, 0.5 grams of saturated fat or trans fat or less. So that basically means when you're looking at a food and you're looking per serving, say it's Walden Farms. Well, the Walden, I don't know if I love you Walden, Farm, Walden Farms. I love Walden Farms. So don't tell okay. me don't tell me anything too bad about Walden Farms. <laughs> 
So if we're looking at a Walden Farms product or something that says calorie-free dressing, then we're looking at a product that per serving has five or less calories and 0.5 grams of fat per serving or less. Meaning that if you are having more than one serving, that could be adding up. So say you have um, three tablespoons per day and the serving size is one tablespoon. You could actually be contributing 1.5 grams of fat to your daily diet by having those three tablespoons. Not a big deal in the scheme of things, but something to keep in mind. Uh, spray butter. So spray butter is basically trans fat in a bottle and they can legally say they don't have anything in it and it's calorie free based on the serving size of like a spray. I think it's five sprays, but that can add up quite quickly. So when, um, in a post that I made on one of my Instagram pages, it actually ended up being the whole bottle of spray bottle was like 60 grams of fat total. Wow. And that's a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. And, and, I, and I like, I can't believe it's not butter too. So I need to be careful with how much I spray. Uh, it, it's funny you mentioned that because that's one of the things that I was going to bring up. I actually read online where some a lady tried to sue. I can't believe it's not butter. I don't know if it was five years ago or six years ago, but it's been, you know, fairly recently because it was marketed as calorie free, zero calories, and mm -hmm. then come to find out, I don't know if she was pouring the, you know, taking the top off and not spraying and pouring it on or how much she was using, but she tried to sue them because it's technically not calorie free. Yeah, and she she had no reason to do. I mean, it sucks, but. Legally, they can do that. So it just needs to be told to the public what they can actually do. You know, I, th I think you said it earlier that it doesn't add up necessarily, you know, in very large amounts. But for someone who's dieting, who is using, you know, a spray oil when they spray the pan, and they're also using a spray butter, and they're also mm -hmm. using a Walden Farms mm -hmm. on their pancakes or their oatmeal, whatever it is, you know, they're using all these calorie-free products. You know, in, in one sitting, one serving of that, no, it definitely doesn't add up. But if you're having 5, 10, 12 of them a day, then it absolutely can. Yeah, the Pam is the biggest one. One spray is about one gram of fat. And nobody uses one single second of a spray. That's one gram of fat. So I know people who bake and they'll just spray and spray and spray and spray. And you're actually contributing a lot of oil. So for my clients, I would rather them just use something like regular olive oil and teaspoon it out. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You know, and it's confusing. I think a lot of people, they don't necessarily, if you haven't really dived into this topic before and you haven't researched it, you know, you just read the label, you see it says zero calories and you think, oh man, I can use as much as I want. Um, when in reality, like you said, no, nobody sprays for one second, just to coat the pan is probably two seconds. And I think most people probably like, like to have a little bit extra. Um, so are there any other products that you can think of off the top of your head that are, you know, maybe oh, there are a bunch. Well, well let's hear them. Okay, so when something says low, low in calories, we're looking at 40 or less per serving. Low fat, 30 grams or less per serving. Um, and then we have reduced or less fat or reduced or less calories. That actually just means it's 25% fewer than the original. So really does not make that much of a difference. Say we're looking at reduced fat Oreos, it's just 25% reduced in fat. And for the most part, that flavor is actually adjusted via more sugar. So it does not mean it's reduced in calories or healthier. It just means that they've adjusted the macronutrient profile. So they've changed, they've swapped out some of the fats for sugars for the most part. Yes. And they very much, they'll do that on the opposite end too. They'll add more fat if they replace sugar. And for example, something that says no added sugars or something that says sugar free does not mean it's low calorie. And it does not mean it's fat free either. For the most part, a lot of low sugar products have a huge amount of fat added to combat the lack of flavor with the sugar. Hmm. And I can see where, you know, it, it, that's very confusing if you're not very well versed in this stuff. So that's why I think it's important to get this information out there. And it's important for people like you to continue to post really good information online on your social media accounts and on your blogs. Uh, and definitely appreciate what you're doing on that front. Um, let, let, let's go back to the frozen food section. We talked about that a little bit in the beginning. You know, I think one of the topics that a lot of people get confused on is, you know, vegetables or frozen foods. 
it's it probably sounds better to buy fresh vegetables, but they're gonna they might go bad if you don't eat them within a couple of days. So a lot of people will opt for the frozen vegetables. Do, do foods lose any nutritional value based on fresh versus frozen versus canned? Um, you know, and kind of kind of go down that and, and walk us through that process. Yeah, so that's a common common question I get. So in regards to frozen, canned, and fresh. So frozen foods are flash frozen at their peak of ripeness. And then we know that that has the maximum amount of nutritional value. However, that does mean that we're going to not have the same texture and taste profile as something that could be fresh. Then we're looking at canned. These have been canned at their peak of um, ripeness. However, there is highly likely sodium added, so we have to keep that in mind. Texture and flavor is going to be changed. Then we're looking at fresh. Looks amazing, has an awesome amount of vitamins and minerals. However, something to keep in mind, just because it's fresh does not mean it's technically quote-unquote fresh because we don't know how long it's been sitting in the heat, how long it's been sitting in the grocery store, how long it was transported because What's important to keep in mind is how long it has been since it was grabbed from um, the field is where you can lose nutrients because of water and then air. So when we're eating a food, those vitamins and minerals can actually leach out based on water, air, and that reduces the quote unquote health of the food. So keep in mind when you're looking at fresh versus frozen, frozen have been captured at their peak fresh is eh, maybe not at their peak. And let's give an example for an apple. An apple could have been sitting in the grocery store for months and you don't know that. So that apple could have a little bit less nutrients, but that it's not that big of a deal, but it's just something to keep in mind. Something also to keep in mind is how you're cooking your fruits and vegetables. So if you're cooking a vegetable, you're going to lose more nutrients when you're cooking it in water. So boiling, steaming in water um, versus if you're microwaving it without water or if you're um, broiling it. So less water, less leaching of nutrients. So what about using the microwave? Is that does that lose nutritional value if I put a bag of asparagus in the microwave? Way less than if you would boil it. Okay. That's good to know. That's really good to know. So so what do you do? What what's obviously you know a lot about this stuff. You've coached people who've had a ton of success and you've also had a lot of success in your own um, you know, physique and body composition journey. What what do you do? Do you buy mostly frozen or do you buy fresh or what do you like to do? I like to combine them. So there's certain foods and vegetables that I know do not taste well frozen. Also keep in mind, you know, the taste is going to be different based on brand. So you got to play around with what brands, like I know pick sweet is awful the way that they, they freeze dry. It's just, it's just awful. And then if I get the, like the name brand of like Kroger's frozen cauliflower, it's just fine. Um, so brands matter, but I like to stick with vegetables that I know are going to be okay frozen and go that route to save some money. And then for fresh, I like to stick to um, all my fruits and then certain vegetables like zucchini and spinach and um, what else do I get a lot? Squash and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Well, while we're in the frozen food section, uh, again, I'm, I'm going off some things I read um, that you posted on Instagram before. What about the, a lot of, one of the most popular desserts now or treats for people, it seems like, are these low calorie um, ice creams, whether it be a Halo Top or an Enlightened or an Arctic Ice. Uh, kind of give me a rundown on that. Are, are those better than getting a tub of Ben and Jerry's? Um, how much better for they are you? And what would be maybe some suggestions if, if you think somebody wants to have one of those to satisfy that sweet tooth? Yeah. So either way, they're all going to have a little bit of dairy. They're all going to have a little bit of gluten. They're all going to have a little bit of sugar. Um, but I think the most important difference between having something like a Ben and Jerry's and Halo Top is the amount of real sugar, real fat and calories in the product. So you're saving a significant amount of calories going to the Halo Top versus the Ben and Jerry's. Now, do they have the same taste and texture profile? No. So if you are craving some ice cream and you go for the Halo Top and you're like, eh, like this isn't really like 
satisfying my craving, that's probably because it's not the actual food that you were craving. So having a little bit of real ice cream may be the route for you. Other people, you know, they by having the Halo Top, they don't care about the texture. Um, they just care about having the, the actual sweetness. So it may work for them if the, te- the taste profile is okay for them. Something also to keep in mind, the Ben & Jerry's is going to be just sugar. The Halo Top is going to have sugar alcohols. And what people don't know and understand about sugar alcohols is the labeling and the calories that they can claim on the label. So that's something to keep in mind. It'll say like 280 calories. Well, Halo Top being 280 calories for a pint, that's taking away from the net carbs. However, we can't just say that the net carbs are going to be the total carbs based on the sugar alcohols and the fiber because we don't know actually how that is digesting in our body. So it actually could be 320 calories for that pint but we don't know because of the net fiber and then the sugar alcohols as well. And people need to understand with the sugar alcohols that they aren't just like a free non-sugar polysaccharide. They can be, they can have a little bit of calories. Normally it's about 0.2. I know Halo Top uses erythrotol or erythritol, however you want to say it. Um, But they also can contribute a lot to stomach gas, bloating, and digestive issues. So just keep in mind when you're eating these products that um, they have different amounts of sugar alcohols that they may they may be a little hard on your digestive system. Well, I'm glad you brought that up about the net carbs too because there's a lot of products out there that are marketed as, you know, it, we only have two grams of net carbs, but if you look on the back, it may say, you know, we've got 14 grams of this and then it's got the fiber amount. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's really confusing to a lot of people. How do you feel about that? I, I know you're big on, you know, tracking macros and tracking your calories. If you were tracking your, your macros or for you or for one of your clients, do you include the total carbs or the net carbs? What's your approach to that? Yeah, I count all carbohydrates. I call count all fiber, all sugar alcohols. And this is just to, to keep consistency. And I know some people who will try and like rack up all the higher sugar alcohol foods or whole, high, high fiber foods in order to get more quote unquote bang for your buck. And then they're just getting more carbs than they need. So I like to say count everything because we don't know. We don't know exactly how that's digesting in our body. And also our digestive systems are each different. So they're each going to extrapolate different amounts of calories based on the foods that we're eating, based on our microbiome, based on the combination of foods. So whether we're having the food with protein or the food with some fat or, or just having the food itself. Yeah, that's another big one that you talked about. You know, we talk about the digestive part of it. And I feel like there's a lot of people that, you know, you think, oh, I'm going to have so much fiber and this is going to be great. And you go overboard with it and you mm-hmm. have too much and, and that can mess up your digestive system as well. So it it's it's not just, you, you know, more of this is better. Everybody has a fiber sweet spot for sure. Some people can take 25 grams of fiber and that's perfect for them. Some other people, they need 40 grams of fiber. For me, I do best at 50 grams of fiber. And I know if one of my clients, especially with the one with IBS, I have a couple with IBS. Um, if they went and they took 50 grams of fiber, they would be a complete mess. So it's all about finding your fiber sweet spot. I think a lot of the keys to this is really finding out what works for you. And in a, oh, com- yeah. in a conversation I had with somebody else uh, a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, we talked about individualism. Um, and, you know, it's it's an interesting topic because we are all the same species. We're all humans. You, you'd like to think that we all, you know, digest things pr- the same way. But we're all very different, too, you know, whether, whether it be food allergies um, or intolerances that, you know, what works for me may not work for you. And that's one reason I think it's important to hire a coach to help with your diet, you know, someone like you, uh, if they're interested in competing or just getting healthier or finding someone who can help them out. But you also have to be very self-aware and you have Mm to kind of recognize what's going on inside your own body and and just pay attention to it. Almost take mental notes about it. Oh yeah. And one of the biggest tools in the toolbox that I like to use with clients is using a food journal. So when you're eating foods, how do you feel? How does your digestive system feel? How is your mental clarity? How do your muscles feel? And how is joint pain? So things to keep in mind because food intolerances, it doesn't just mean how your digestive system is doing. It's what your whole body in it. Is there systemic inflammation going on? 
Yeah. Yeah. Re- really good uh, topic that I think a lot of people can improve upon. Um, I-, I think a food journal is a great idea. You know, sometimes I speak with people and I ask them what they eat and they say, oh, well, I eat really healthy. Well, how much do you, like, what do you eat? Tell me specifically. And well, sometimes <laughs> I have this. And a lot of times people, you know, I don't know what the exact reason is, but they're just not really paying attention to it. Uh, at least with the level of detail that they need to have or probably should have if they want to have exceptional results there, you know, a physique competitor or they're trying to be a high level athlete. Um, I think a food journal is a, a, a great thing to do. Maybe not every single day. I'm not saying you have to track your food every day for the rest of your life, but if you've never done it before, I think anybody can gain value out of tracking your food for a week or two weeks. Um, and really just becoming more, um, more aware of what's going inside mm-hmm. your body. That's the whole reason I love macros and macro counting is because it allows you to learn and become educated on what is in your foods. So it forces you to read labels. It forces you to learn serving sizes. So say you go and you have some brown rice, then somebody tracking the brown rice, if they're doing it the right way, they'll be looking at the label. They'll be looking at what they're inputting it. They'll be looking at the serving size that they're using and they'll realize, Hey, this actually has some more fiber than if I chose some white potato. Hey, this actually has a better serving size and a bigger serving size than if I would have had a banana. So it really helps you learn what's in your foods, learn serving sizes, and then use that information to be able to apply that to your day-to-day life in the future. So when you're going out to eat, you already know, hey, this meal has about this many calories or this many carbs and this would be a great option for me right now. Yeah, well, let me ask you this. I'm going to get off on a tangent a little bit, but I think it's very similar to what we're talking about. How do you feel about people who choose a diet, you know, if it fits your macros or flexible dieting or whatever you want to call it? And and for the listeners who maybe aren't aware of it, um, Lacey's spoken a lot today about, you know, counting your calories, counting your macros, knowing what's going on in your body. The the term flexible dieting or if it fits your macros, for those of you who aren't aware, basically means that you you have a daily set number of calories and macronutrients, which is your, your, your protein, carbs, and fats. And if you can fit different foods into your uh, daily allowance, then you can make them work. So we talked about Halo Top earlier. So maybe you save some of your calories and carbohydrates and you fit in that Halo Top in the evening. Um, Some people choose to do that. How do you go about that? Do you, do you, what would you say your diet is? I mean, is it flexible dieting? Is it fairly strict or what would you say that you do and what do you advise a lot of your clients to do? Yeah. So flexible dieting does not mean being absolutely flexible and trying to fit as many foods as you can into your daily diet. It just means being flexible with your food choices. So for example, being able to switch out proteins, so fish for turkey or ground beef, or carbohydrates for oatmeal, for brown rice, for sweet potato, fruits, being able to go from blackberries to strawberries to bananas. So it's just being flexible in your day-to-day choices and not being so stuck in your ways and having food boredom. Um, Here and there, I like to say, of course, add in something that you're really craving. That's why I love flexible dieting. So especially for women, if you're PMSing, you can add in a little bit of chocolate. You can add in a little um, sweet halo top, but that doesn't mean making that halo top fit in every single day because it's still an ice cream and we still want to keep it as a treat. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of people screw up. You know, they, like I said, they do. For, as for a lack of information, maybe you get online and you hear about this thing called flexible dieting, you know, and it sounds sexy. It sounds, oh man, I can, as long as I can fit it in mm-hmm. my daily macros, it'll work for me. And like you said, no, it's not just, hey, let's see how many halo tops I can get in and still meet my protein for the day. Uh, it's still making good choices, um, but, but maybe, you know, here and there you can swap some things out. Yeah, I always tell my clients 90% whole unprocessed foods, 10% wiggle room. Um, And also, it also matters how and what time you're eating your food as well. And that's going to help contribute to your hunger levels as well as your insulin levels. Yeah, that's man, that's a whole other topic we can get into for maybe another. I might have to have you back on where we can talk about some of these (laughs) other topics because there's a whole, uh, there's a whole other topic and and debate that we could have right there just about hormones and insulin. Um, but, but I do want to try to stick to kind of today's topic. So, but this is all very interesting. You know, I I like learning about this stuff and hopefully this is helpful for the people at home uh, who are listening as well. I, I do want to talk about a couple more different things, you know, as we walk through the grocery store. Another thing you hear, you know, 
really often now, whether it be on TV commercials or on Dr. Oz or whoever it is, you know, people want to get the non GMO food or the, the chicken, you know, no steroids added, um, or grass fed beef. Um, I'd love to hear what you think about some of those different topics. Uh, does it change the nutritional value of the food? And if it doesn't change the nutritional value of the food, do you think there are any other benefits, um, that you can have from maybe eating a more, a more natural product? Yeah, so let's first dive into what organic means. So organic means that the animals have not been given antibiotics or hormones. There's no conventional pesticides or fertilized users. However, they do use um, organic pesticides, natural pesticides. Um, And then normal animal conditions, meaning the animal is allowed, if it's normally in day-to-day life allowed pasture, then it's given pasture. Um, Organic foods have no GMOs. Something that people do not understand, however, for chickens and turkey, yes, it's no antibiotics added, except in organic foods, chicken and turkey can be given in an egg or in the first day of life in the egg, they can be given antibiotics. So something to keep in mind. Something that is non-GMO does not necessarily mean it's going to be organic. It just means that it does not contain genetically modified organisms. However, scientifically, we know that genetically modified organisms do not mean that they're unhealthy. It just means that they've been genetically modified. There are many genetically modified foods that are actually highly nutrition and are highly nutritious and are constantly saving lives. For example, we have rice that is made in Africa and that is fortified with vitamin A and treating vitamin A deficiency that is huge and rampant and make and causing so many deaths over there. So we also have things like the Arctic apple that has been genetically modified to resist temperature changes and be able to hold on to its vitamins and minerals while it's sitting in the store. Like I said previously, the apple can be sitting in the store for months. So that genetically modified food is resisting that and is able to hold on to its vitamins and minerals for a longer period of time. So just because something is genetically modified does not mean it's unhealthy. We do not know the long-term effects of genetically modified foods just yet. So something to think about, you know, I like to say we don't know, so don't say it's right or wrong. Another thing to keep in mind is the genetically modified food label, the non-GMO food label is not regulated at all. So something can say non-GMO and we don't actually know if it has GMOs or not. Mm, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. It's actually a voluntary food label. Oh, wow. Huh. Well, so is pasture raised. (laughs) How about that? You know, there's all these things that, it's, it's so deceptive, you know, people, uh, you know, you, you want to do what's right. And I know a lot of people that are probably listening, they're, they're trying to improve their health, but a lot of the people that are probably listening are also parents and they're trying to put in, you know, good food, uh, into their children's bodies. So, you know, there's so much information out there when you hear something's just unregulated and it's completely at the discretion of the manufacturer that kind of raises some red flags. Mm -hmm. And another thing you had mentioned to go over would be the hormones. So actually, if something that says, let's say it's a, it's chicken and it says no hormones added. Well, guess what? Hormones are not allowed in poultry or pig products anyway. So that marketing label is just a marketing label. It, It does not mean anything. Hormones can only be added to beef products and dairy products. Again, I'm I'm learning all sorts of new stuff on this podcast. So, uh, like I said, we'll definitely have to have you on again because this is very informative. I know for me, but for for other people as well. Um, now, I, I've read. I'm not great at citing sources. I, I like to read a lot. I do read some studies. I read a lot of articles. I've read a number of things, and you mentioned that we don't necessarily know the long term effects of these foods that are you know non GMO versus uh, GMO. Um, it, it seems to me like the scientific community or the evidence based community. They seem to think that there are not really negative side effects or not really downsides to these foods that have, you know, hormones added. What what do you think about that? I mean, is, is there something that you think, you know, I try to stay away from them or I think they're probably OK? I know we don't have long term studies that are 30 years old yet, but in your best you know opinion, what, what are your thoughts on those? 
I think 100% depends on what the actual food is. Um, so if we're looking at something like the Arctic apple where the apple has been changed, well, that is the apple's genes, and the apple's genes are not going to affect our genes at all. Um, and then we're looking at hormones that have been added to dairy. Yes, I do think that the hormones added to dairy can change the profile of the dairy and can potentially influence our own hormone levels. So it just depends on what the food is. And that's why it's important that people become aware and educated about all these different topics, you know, whether it be the hormones or the organic or the natural or whatever it is. Um, you know, it's important that people really take this stuff seriously. I, I honestly 100% believe that the most important thing you do is the food you put in your body. Yes, going mm -hmm. to the gym is important. Working out is important. Getting your, you know, cardiovascular system is uh, is important. But if, if you're putting poor quality foods in your body, you're going to you're gonna perform negatively. Your body composition is going to reflect that. Um, so it's important that people understand these things and they realize and, and they need to do some research. It's, it's important. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's the most important thing you can do is what goes into your body. Yeah. And just to make sure that people understand the differences in regards to health, um, for conventional versus organic meats, poultry and fruits and vegetables. So and when we're looking at the literature, there are potential benefits in more vitamins and minerals and organic food, so different fruits and vegetables. However, there are different vitamins and minerals that we've seen to be higher in conventional products. So it's very much like a teeter-totter. There's not really much of a difference at all between those products. But we do know in regards to organic meat and egg products that there are higher amounts of omega-3 fatty acids versus omega-6 fatty acids because these organic animals are fed organic feed and not fed just grain products. So not just fed like wheat or seeds. So we know that if we're going towards the organic meat and poultry and eggs, that we're getting more benefits there than the conventional. That, that's really important. I'm glad you brought that up because there's two other things that are very similar that I wanted to ask you about that, that kind of go along the same, uh, same road that does. So you talked about foods that have very similar macronutrient profiles, but they're different micronutrient profiles. I know a couple of things that come to my mind are, you know, peanut butter and almond butter. If you look at the back of the mm -hmm. labels, they're going to look very similar, but almond butter seems to have more micronutrients. And another one comes, you know, white rice versus brown rice. M macronutrient wise, they're going to have about the same. They're going to be pretty similar, but the micronutrients, you're going to get a lot more out of the brown rice. Um, do, you, do you feel like that's an important thing to take into account when you're choosing foods? Um, or, you know, kind of where does that fall on the spectrum of importance? There's so many things we can dive into with those two topics. <laughs> Ooh. That's why we got oh. you on here. We're trying to learn from you. I know. Okay, so let's start with the almond butter and the peanut butter. So these are going to, of course, have different vitamins and minerals. But what we're looking at mostly are the balance of omega-3 fatty acids to omega-6 fatty acids. So the almond butter is going to have higher amounts of omega-3s, which are anti-inflammatory, versus the peanut butter, which is going to have a little bit more of omega-6s, which are more pro-inflammatory. Um, of course, overall, that is having both of those is so much better than having an inflammatory vegetable oil. So something to keep in mind. Both great sources of uh, fat. They do have a little bit of protein, but they're not just straight sources of protein. People think like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have some peanut butter. That's protein. No. It's like six grams of protein. That's nothing compared to chicken. That's like 25 grams of protein. Totally rambled. Just wanted to get that out. <laughs> so that would be the peanut butter and the almond butter. Make sure when you're looking at those foods, guys, that you're looking at if there are added um, added fats to that as well as added salt. So I like to say look at the ingredient label. If it has like soybean oil, coconut oil added, um, just keep that in mind. Um, and then we're looking at the white rice versus the brown rice. We're 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 looking at whether this food is going to be have more vitamins and minerals and fiber and looking at the blood sugar response as well. So say that we have the white rice. Well, the good news with the white rice is it's going to be easily digestible. So somebody who has IBS, IBD might 
have more benefits from eating the white rice because it will contribute to less inflammation and be able to easily be digestible. However, that's going to spike your blood sugar levels faster because it is not a complex carbohydrate and it does not contain the fiber that the brown rice has. So the brown rice is going to spike your blood sugar at a slower rate spike your insulin at a slower rate, and that is going to not cause a high blood sugar that's just gonna crash afterwards. But something to keep in mind also is that the food you're eating with that food will also contribute to the blood sugar response. So if you're having protein, if you're having vegetables with fiber, um, and you're having the white rice, and that will help slow the blood sugar response with the white rice too. So it's all about what you're eating, but also what you're eating with what you're eating. Yeah, it's amazing how, you know, eating foods together, you know, changes the glycemic response. And you've mentioned insulin a couple times so far in the last little while. So I want to ask you, do, do you feel like people should try to aim for having lower glycemic index foods to control the insulin spike? Or do you feel like there's a time and place for it? Um, you, you know, I'd love to hear what you think about that because it's a complex topic. Uh, but I think a lot of people, you know, are confused about because there's a lot of there's a lot of research out there. There's a lot of information, and it can be confusing if you're not extremely well versed in it. If you're not a dietitian, so I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I'm not saying insulin. The insulin fairy is the devil, but hands down, we do know that um, having constantly high levels of insulin contributes to our risk of diabetes and chronic disease. Um, we also know that complex carbohydrates have a lot more vitamins and minerals for the most part, unless they're ref unless we're looking at refined, fortified, refined grains, um, that they have a lot more benefits than a pure refined grain. So I like to say, focus your diet on whole grains for sure. Okay. Well, what about potatoes? Because again, you know, a lot of people want to swap out sweet potatoes for white potatoes or white potatoes for sweet potatoes. Um, what are the differences there? So the differences lie in the glycemic response, the resistant starch that can actually form in the product, um, and then in regards to the vitamins and minerals. So sweet potatoes would be a better source of things like vitamin A than a red potato. Okay. So it's all going to depend on the potato. It's going to depend on how you cook the potato, um, if the potato is allowed to cool or not. Um, so there's many different things to think about, but I just like to say, if you like potatoes, find a potato you like, have some vegetables with it, have some protein with it and just go with it. Yeah. Well, you know, we talked about it earlier. This stuff can be super confusing and super overwhelming for maybe it somebody who's just getting into it. And I think that's a really good tip. Um, that, that you don't have to get so complicated and so deep into the weeds. Um, what would be some other, you know, I'd say beginner tips or maybe tips for somebody who's starting to research nutrition, you know, that they want to start eating healthier, or maybe they're responsible for buying the food for their, their children or their household. What would be just a couple of tips? You know, what are a few things that you can do to make sure you're putting higher quality foods into your house and into your body? Focus on foods that, um, they come from whole whole products. So if something is, you know, fruit and vegetable, of course, it's going to be already good for you. So don't worry if it's GMO or not. Um, and then in regards to looking at different food labels and titles, don't get so caught up in the media and just really focus on what makes you feel good, getting a good variety of nutrients. So don't worry about cholesterol being crazy or worrying about high amounts of sodium um, in a in meat product or what. Just, just try and get a full balance of micronutrients, variety in your diet, lots of color. I'm glad you said that because that's something that I feel like a lot of people, man, they just get bogged down with. You know, you, you maybe you recommend this or you say something and they talk about, well, the sodium in it is, th is this and it's got this level of this and it has uh, artificial sweeteners added. And like you said, how does it make you feel? Uh, I, I think if, if you eat food that makes you feel good um, and you're eating at your, you know, your caloric uh, level that you, you're trying to achieve, uh, there's a, probably a pretty good chance that you're going to have the results you want or you're going to get the results you want over time. Um, again, as long as there's an adherence and you stick to your diet and things like that. But a lot of it's about how it makes you feel. Like I know for me, there are a lot of you know, quote unquote, healthy foods that I just don't feel great when I eat, whether it be mm -hmm, for digestive same. reasons, 
um, or, or whatnot. And I think it's important that, like I said, you really start to listen to your body and you kind of start to, you know, really take ownership of this uh, and just pay attention to what's going on after you put the foods in your body as well. Yeah, exactly. It's all going to be about listening to your body. Um, I know for me, if I have, if I have a lot of broccoli, I'm a bloated, gassy mess. If I have sweet potatoes, which are a great carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate, my whole body just has inflammation. So just because something is some is good for somebody does not mean it's necessarily going to be good for you. And we can throw into gluten into this conversation. Just because somebody needs to take away gluten for their diet does not mean that you need to take gluten away from your diet. Um, gluten is not just a carbohydrate you need to run from. Gluten is just a protein found in wheat that can be inflammatory for people with autoimmune or thyroid disorders. So it's all about figuring what's going to be best for you. And if you are confused about nutrition, the best thing you can do is hire a professional, hire a registered dietitian. So that would be my biggest takeaway from this. Well, you're, you're absolutely right because it, even people who are well-versed in this stuff, and I, I feel like I try to read as much as possible. I try to study as much as possible, but I definitely don't know everything out there. There's a lot of people that know a lot more than I do. So I think it's really important to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, who, are, who know more than you, and can kind of lead you down the right path, whether it be you know hiring a coach or hiring a dietitian um, or making a connection with somebody at the gym or a, a, a local person in your community. Uh, really good advice, and like I said, I, I think it's important um you know we can definitely plug your services uh, before we get into that what you do online with coaching people um one of the first things that you mentioned in the show that i want to circle back to is you talked about you know different grocery stores you know kroger and walmart and you didn't say whole foods but whole foods is what came into my mind as you, t- as you think about these expensive uh you know grocery stores that sell high quality foods and expensive foods um what, what are your thoughts on you know a whole foods versus a kroger or an heb is there is there a place for that, or is it mostly just over marketed, overpriced food, or do you think some of it has you know some real benefit to it? Yeah, so really, it's just going to be what you're going to find at the grocery store. Whole Foods works with different companies that are more focused on minimally processed foods, all natural foods, foods that have um, better nutrient profiles than others. Um, so I like Whole Foods because it'll have different brands that I would never find at something like Kroger. So I love the brand Lesser Evil. I would never find that at Kroger. Lesser Evil has things like little um, cheese puffs and little snacks that are delicious. Um, but I'm going to anyway, have to look for that because I haven't had that before, but that sounds pretty good. Oh my God, they're good. so good. You have to get the little, um, the Lesser Evil Cheddar Puffs. They're made out of chickpea flour and nutritional yeast and they're vegan. So there's a lot more options for vegans speaking of Whole Foods, but different brands hook up with companies like Whole Foods or Sprouts and they only sell the products there. So that's why some people go to those stores to find those foods that they would not find at a different grocery store. Yeah. Well, I personally like Whole Foods. Um, you know, I do feel like it's expensive. I do too, but you're paying for the most part, you're paying for just the grocery store. You're paying for the label is really what it is. So if you go get omega-3, if you go get some eggs, organic eggs from Whole Foods versus organic eggs from Kroger, you're basically just paying a $2 difference and you're paying for the Whole Foods price. Yeah. Well, I think that's good to know. And as long as people, you know, know that going into it, you can choose to shop wherever you want based on whatever your your personal situation is. Uh, But but it's just good to know. There there are going to be some things that they're going to be the same whether you buy at Whole Foods or Walmart. And there may be some things that are, you know, slightly different. Um, Yeah. And then we have to go into, you know, the whole thing that these grocery stores do. So Whole Foods knows that when you walk into the store, they can make it look pretty, nice and organized, make it look like it's all natural. So when you walk in, you know, you see you can grab all the, the things straight out of the bins. People like doing that. They play music to make it happy and make you want to go towards certain, um, things because when you're happy, it's, it's been shown to, um, elevate the prices that you'll say, okay to buy. And then they have things that are, you know, it's nice and green. So of course you're thinking everything is all healthy. And then you go into Kroger. Normally there's not any music. Um, everything's not green. Um, and then the layout is not as pretty as Whole Foods. So there's just different things to think about there. Whole Foods, hands down, has done research into knowing what is going to make you buy food. 
a lot of research on top of that. So one of my, I guess, side interests is psychology. And I read a lot of psychology books and they've done a lot of studies on grocery stores. And you mentioned the music. So one of the things they do with the music is they know exactly the tempo of the music, which beats per minute, um, makes people walk faster and walk slower. And they play music that makes people walk slower because the more time you spend in the grocery store, the more likely you are to spend more money. So if, if they're playing something that's super up tempo and it feels like you're at the club uh, and you're flying through there, you're bouncing around, you're not going to spend as much time. You'll get out and you're going to buy less just because there's something that, that doesn't catch your eye. But if you're if they're playing you know, a James Taylor or a slow jam, you walk a little bit slower, you're going to stroll a little bit more leisurely down the aisles. You might see something. Um, so really interesting what they do. Uh, I guess you could call it tricky or deceptive. I don't know. I mean, I guess if I owned a grocery store, I'd probably do the same thing. Uh, but, I would the, do. but it's it's similar to what the casinos in Vegas do, you know, mm-hmm. with, with no clocks and the the crazy patterns on the floor. So you don't want to you don't want to focus on the floor or the ceiling. You always want. Oh my god, you were so right. I never thought about that. Yeah, it's crazy how all these people do the exact same thing, just in, in kind of different domains. Um, but it really is. I mean, it's that type of game that these people are playing. Uh, so again, if, if you know that. I think it's I think it just gives you one more bullet in your gun that you can use to to kind of combat some of the, you know, the negative repercussions or the negative effects that you might fall, you know, fall victim to. Yeah, for sure. So really interesting, you know, uh, there's so many things that we could talk about. And like I said, I definitely appreciate your time. Like I said, I, I wasn't lying. I'm, I'd like to have you back on at some point to maybe dive into some, some deeper topics uh, because we really bounced around and spoke about a lot of different things today. But before we get off, I do want to talk about, you know, what you do as a dietitian and what you do as an online coach. Um, go ahead and tell me, again, I'm familiar with the online coaching world, but for someone who's maybe they're listening to this for the first time, they're just now getting introduced to you. What do you do or how do you help people, you know, get their nutrition right, whether it be a fitness competitor or just, a, you know, an average everyday uh, Joe that wants to, you know, become a little bit healthier? What are your services you provide and where can they find you? Yeah, so everything that I do is online. I am an online dietitian. So I like to give people macronutrient profiles. I give them meal plans. I give them fitness workout plans because I am also a certified personal trainer. Um, And I really try and focus on helping people find their lifestyle approach that's going to be sustainable for them in reaching their goals, as well as helping them to, to develop healthy habits. That's the biggest thing is changing your habits and forming a sustainable lifestyle. I'm not about quick fixes. Fast, quick fixes tend to lead to quick rebounds. So I'm helping people change their lifestyle in order to sustain their results and be able to thrive in their day-to-day life. So that is my goal, finding, helping people find something that's going to be good for them and help them enjoy their life better versus take away from their life. Because if something, if the way you're eating and your quote-unquote lifestyle change takes away from your life, then it is not the lifestyle change for you. Yes, yeah, it's not a net positive change. If you're change if you're changing so dramatically that that you know you're having you know bad effects, so you don't feel well, you're miserable all the time. That's probably a net negative change. And you mentioned a couple of times habits. I am a huge believer uh, on developing good habits and creating habits. I've actually read a couple of books recently about it. One was Atomic Habits uh, by James Clear, and the other was I think The Power of Habit by uh, somebody. Do it. I forget the guy's name. It starts with a D. Um, but yeah, creating habits, I believe, is one of the most important parts of having a sustainable lifestyle. You, you know, where you can eat healthy. It's keeping the right food at the house, keeping the right food visible, keeping keeping the wrong foods out of the house, which might even be more important than keeping the right foods in the house. Um, but yeah, it's all about building habits and really building an environment that you're able to thrive in. So I think it's, I think it's helpful having somebody like you um, who can, you know, coach me along or coach someone along as they're trying to get into this, or if they're trying to become more serious and, and become a physique competitor, whether it be bikini like you or, or, or bodybuilding like me, um, you know, you got to have somebody that can help hold you accountable. That can be an, a different set of eyes that can look at you objectively and give you a true opinion and just help you along the way and help you kind of figure out what works for you and what doesn't. So, uh, Lacey, definitely appreciate having you on. Like I said, ton of great information. I'm going to link to you in the show notes, but where can people find you online? Again, if you'll list your website, uh, it'll be listed below the, below this podcast, but your Instagram, like I said, I know you've got a huge Instagram account with over 300,000, 
uh, 335 or 337,000 followers. I know you're big on Twitter as well, but where can people find you? Anybody can follow me on Instagram at faith and fit. You can also follow my page at uplift fit nutrition. I have some of my clients and my friends who help run that one. So all about encouraging, encouraging you and educating you in your process and in your journey. Um, you can email me if you have any questions, if you want to reach out for coaching at fit and faith at gmail.com. Um, and then in regards to any questions that you may have, you can also check out my podcast at um, which is Uplift Fit Nutrition Radio. That's on iTunes and SoundCloud. And I've covered a variety of topics from bodybuilding to general dieting, fat loss mistakes, um, thyroid health, PCOS, losing your period, all the above. I'm very much a nerd. Um, and I do have exciting things in the in the works right now for anybody who has thyroid or gut issues. So just keep following me if you have any of that. Yeah, we'll have to get an update from you when some of that stuff comes out. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It was such an honor. And I hope your listeners were able to take away um, some things to really help them in making healthy habits and lifestyle changes. There you go. Well, I know I was able to and I uh, definitely appreciate you uh, being on here and taking some time out of your day. And I'm sure everybody else was able to learn uh, from you as well. So Lacey, thanks again. Definitely appreciate having you on. And I uh, would like to talk to you again in the future at some point. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Train with Zan podcast. Where our goal is to help you look, feel, and perform like an athlete. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening and follow Zan on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. The training doesn't have to stop here. For today's show notes and more information about training, nutrition, and fitness, head on over to trainwithzan.com and join the team. 